We have already seen that a combination switch controls the headlights and as with most other BL cars it also controls the direction indicators and the horns. The hazard warning lights are operated by a panel mounted switch. The circuit is quite conventional. The heated backlight is relay controlled. It is operated by a switch on the instrument panel. A warning lamp confirms its operation. Incidentally, on vehicles fitted with air conditioning, the heated backlight can only operate when the mode selector is in the vent, heater or defrost position. In this situation, if fan speed 4 is selected, it will automatically be reduced to speed 3. A warning lamp is also fitted to encourage the use of seat belts. It will light if seat belts are not being worn by the driver or front passenger when the ignition is switched on. The system comprises the warning lamp, one, a switch built into each front belt anchor, two, and a pressure operated switch, three, built into the front passenger seat. If the front passenger seat is occupied, the pressure switch, 66, is closed and completes the circuit, shown in yellow, through the warning lamp, 68. The circuit is only broken when both passenger and driver fasten their seat belts, thereby opening switches 67 and 69. The green line shows how the lamp is illuminated when there is no front passenger. Yet another Rover safety feature is the brake failure warning system. The two bulb indicator warns the driver if the handbrake is on, if the fluid level is low, or if the efficiency of one of the dual brake lines is reduced. With the ignition 45 switched on and the handbrake applied, the handbrake switch 58 completes the circuit shown in yellow through bulbs 54 and 57. This causes the indicator to glow at low intensity. A low fluid level or a brake line failure will close switch 55 or 56 and complete the earth path through bulb 54 alone. The result is that the indicator glows at a high intensity. The handbrake lamp, 57, can only operate if the other lamp, 54, is intact and is therefore a check on its condition. Failure of the handbrake warning lamp should not be dismissed as trivial. That completes this section on warning lamps. Now the windscreen wipers. A two-speed system is fitted to all models. Control of the motor unit 1 is by means of a switch 2 mounted on the steering column. On 2600 and 3500 models, a delay unit 3 is incorporated into the circuit to provide an intermittent wiping facility. The delay unit comprises an electrically heated bimetallic switch. As the moving contact heats up, it breaks the power supply to the motor. On cooling, the circuit is remade and the wipers operate again. The two-speed wiper motor is located beneath the right-hand bonnet grille. The motor has a built-in parking switch which functions on all modes of wiper operation. When the wiper motor is switched on, current, shown in red, enters the column switch at pin 3 and leaves at pin 5. It then enters pin 5 of the motor connector and the wipers operate at low speed. If high speed is selected, current leaves the column switch at pin 1 and passes via pin 3 of the motor connector to the high speed brush. When intermittent operation is selected, current flows directly to pin 4 of the delay unit. It leaves at pin 3, passes through the column switch and then through pin 5 of the motor connector to the low speed brush. At the same time, current, shown in green, flows through the heating coil in the delay unit and through the column switch to earth. As the coil heats up, 
The switch contacts in the delay unit change over. Current then flows directly to pin 4 of the motor. It passes through the parking switch and leaves at pin 2. From here, it passes through the delay unit to the column switch and from there to the low-speed brush. Current continues to flow through the delay unit heating coil until the park position is reached. Failure of the delay unit will not affect the normal two-speed operation of the wipers. A suspect unit should therefore be checked by substitution. If the wipers fail to operate, a simple method of determining whether the fault is the motor unit or in the column switch is to use a test plug. This is a wiper motor plug made up with red, blue, yellow and white leads. During testing, make sure the screen is kept wet. Fit the test plug and connect the red lead to the battery supply and the blue lead to earth. The wipers should operate at low speed. To test high speed operation, substitute the yellow lead for the red lead. Then stop the wipers in mid-travel. Now to test the park switch, connect the red lead to the battery supply and the white lead to the negative terminal. The wipers should move to their park position and stop. If the motor operates correctly, the fault lies in the column switch or connecting leads. Next, the windscreen washer. It comprises a control switch 1, an electric pump 2, the reservoir 3, and the delivery pipes and jets 4. The pump is operated by the push switch at the end of the wiper stalk. The circuit is very simple and troubleshooting should be quite straightforward. That completes this section on the windscreen wash wipe system. Rerun the section if it has not been fully understood. Now we will have a look at the charging system. All models are fitted with an ACR or a Motorola machine sensed alternator, one, which incorporate a rectifier and a regulator. The other components are the battery, two, the ignition switch, three, a warning lamp, four, and the starter solenoid, five. When the ignition 45 is on, the warning lamp 79 lights as a circuit shown in yellow is completed through the regulator inside the alternator 1. When the alternator rotates, the output current switches off the earth path and the lamp is extinguished, as both of its terminals are at the same potential. Let's have a look at troubleshooting the circuit. First, check the state of the battery, and then the drive belt tension. Next, remove the alternator connector and switch on the ignition, but do not start the engine. Connect a voltmeter between a good earth and each connector terminal in turn. The voltmeter should indicate battery voltage. If the indicator terminal voltage is zero, check the warning lamp and its connections. If the main output terminal voltage is zero, check the wiring and the connections to the starter solenoid and the battery. For the remaining tests, remove the alternator cover, then refit the connector plug. Now, with the ignition switched on, measure the voltage at the indicator terminal. A zero reading indicates a faulty surge protection diode. If, however, the reading is 12 volts, then measure the voltage at the regulator case. It should be half a volt. If this is correct, then a fault in the brushes or rotor winding is indicated. Next, start the engine and run it at 3000 RPM. Measure the voltage at the battery positive terminal V1 and at the alternator main output V2. If the readings differ by more than half a volt, examine the wiring and the connections between the alternator and the battery. Again, with the engine running at 3000 RPM, measure the voltage at the main output terminal V1, then at the indicator terminal V2. If these readings differ by more than half a volt, the rectifier pack is faulty and must be replaced. Finally, 
connect an ammeter between the starter solenoid and the alternator main output terminal. Run the engine at 3000 RPM and when the ammeter reads less than 10 amps, measure the voltage across the battery terminals. If it is not approximately 14 volts, the regulator is faulty. That completes the section on the charging circuit. Further information on alternators and charging circuits will be found in the Starvi program's ACR alternators and vehicle electrics overhaul.